welcome back to AppSec Village. Hope you're having a great time here at DEF CON 2020. Get ready for another wonderful talk. We've got Jared Overson, and he's going to talk about Hackium, a browser for web hackers. Okay, let's be honest. With a name like Hackium, you've got to kind of check it out. It's like the coolest name ever. I know I'm going to be watching this one. Jared is the Director of Engineering at Shape Security, now F5, where he designed and led the development of Shape's enterprise web security platform. Jared is a frequent speaker on modern web threats and has been quoted by Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and CNET, along with many others. He co-authored O'Reilly's Developing Web Components book, delivered dozens of analysis and reverse engineering tools, and frequently writes about web development and fraud. Please welcome Jared to the AppSec security stage. Hey! Hi! Uh, hi! Thank you! This is... Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you. This is awesome. This is this is so cool. I, I this is this is strange. This is strange. This is I I, I can't lie. This is strange. Uh, I can't see you. You're you're not actually here with me. Um, and I was gonna have slides. Uh, and then it started feeling like a webinar uh, with my little picture in the corner. And uh, a, a webinar is the last thing I think of when I think of DefCon, and I just I couldn't do it. I, I just physically could not do it, uh, so uh, we're just gonna we're gonna do this live, um, except pre-recorded with a whole bunch of cuts and and whatever. Uh, but it is it is what it is. This is this is a strange time. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm excited to talk to you about what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, but first, who am I? Uh, I'm, I'm Jared Overson. Uh, I talk a lot about uh, credential stuffing and automated attacks, uh, and I'm just a, I'm, I'm a web hacker. I've been hacking the web for the million years. Uh, I work at Shape Security, uh, now part of F5, Director of Engineering, uh, where I built uh, Shape's enterprise web application security platform. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was an awesome opportunity because it gave me the chance to uh, basically make a product that would defeat me. Uh, and that was fun. I, I, I thought like, well, I, I could do this, uh, but then I could beat me by doing this. Uh, and then if I did this, then I could do that. And if I did that, I could do this. And it was, it was just a cool, fun game against myself. I ended up building something pretty cool, uh, but I'm no longer building that anymore. Uh, and uh, I, I'm building other things, uh, which is what I'm going to talk to you today about. Uh, but enough about me. Uh, you. Let's talk about you. Uh, I mean, everybody knows who you are. It's it's really awesome to have you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so let's get started. So I am I am really excited uh, to to introduce uh, th three major tools, uh, but a, really a whole suite of tools that I guess I've been working on for my entire life. Every six to 12 months, I seem to rebuild uh, part of these tools in order to do something with the internet and the web that I want to do, but can't given the, the way the web works. Uh, so over the course of the past 20 plus years, uh, I've been crafting and honing my strategy uh, for manipulating web stuff. And over the course of the past year, year and a half, I've started to to, uh, to, to focus those into a few projects uh, to see how good I could make it. And I'm really happy with what I've got. So today, I'm going to be talking about uh, three major projects. Uh, Hackium is the one that's going to be most interesting to most people because it feels like a browser. Uh, but Shift Refactor and Shift Interpreter are much more technically complex and give you the ability to uh, to to mold and twist JavaScript uh, like you're a magician. And uh, JavaScript, I know, is not always the most well-respected language in uh, security circles, uh, but you can't get away from it on the web. JavaScript's what you got, and you have to deal with it. And when more and more business logic is showing up in websites, you have to understand more of it because uh, what is transmitted from a web page to a server uh, is becoming less and less understandable on its own. Uh, so all these tools together give you the ability to uh, manipulate web stuff, understand web stuff, and transform web, web stuff uh, so that you can just control it better, which is awesome. All right, so this session, I'm going to be going over uh, three or four major topics. 
Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, what Hackium is. Uh, going to be going over the REPL and the initialization command and configuration so you can get started. Uh, and then I'm going to be going over how to use Hackium with external services uh, like uh, to CAPTCHA to solve CAPTCHAs and also how Hackium uh, generates human behavior to make it uh, uh, bypass trivial defenses more easily. Uh, and finally, going to be going over how to use Hackium with Shift Refactor and Shift Interpreter to automatically, programmatically uh, deobfuscate JavaScript. Hackium is uh, a command line tool. Uh, it can act as a browser. It's an automation framework. Uh, it, it, it is a foundation for building uh, web hacking stuff. So Hackium is a Node.js library. Uh, it is installable via NPM. Uh, you can install it via npm install dash g hackium, uh, which will install the hackium library and the command line tool globally. So you can install hackium, it's npm install dash g hackium. Do 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 bow do do do, do. npm will do all of the stuff that it needs to do. It's downloading Chromium R seven eight two zero seven eight. So Chromium is downloaded via Puppeteer right now, uh, and it's a bundled Chromium that is guaranteed to work with that particular version of Puppeteer. Uh, Hackium uh, started as a bunch of Puppeteer scripts that grew and were extended and copied over and over again over the course of a long period of time. Uh, and for the time being, uh, Hackium extends a lot of Puppeteer's functionality and reuses the bundled version of Chromium, and it will continue to do this for as long as possible until the code bases of each diverge in a way where uh, code reuse is no longer possible. All right, so now we have Hackium installed locally, version 1.0.4. We start that up, we get what looks like a normal Chrome browser. Since we have Hackium running, we can use it just like we would any browser. It comes with one extension pre-installed as the Puppeteer extension bridge, one of the uh, dependent projects for Hackium. This allows Hackium to uh, communicate to and from the Chrome extension API. So uh, Hackium also exposes all the Chrome extension API uh, to Node.js scripts and automation scripts uh, so that you have access to a a, a lot of additional functionality that is uh, normally inaccessible from uh, command line scripts. So Hackium also includes uh, an in-page client for uh, plugins and functionality to hook onto. So there's a consistent way to, uh, to share and communicate uh, between the extension uh, and the automation script behind Hackium. So we can uh, uh, use the event bridge to communicate with the extension. We can post messages back to our uh, automation script. Um, and if we had anything else on here, we'd be able to uh, access them. So Hackium also exposes a REPL to the command line. Uh, let's see, we have access to page, which is our active page. Page.go2htsexample.com. Go to example.com. Let's go back to Google. So you can use the REPL to do everything that you would normally do within a Puppeteer or Hackium script. Uh, here we are typing into the input uh, that has the attribute aria-label equals search. Uh, we're typing Hackium uh, with a new line at the end uh, to, to basically just uh, uh, search for the term Hackium in, in Google's website. Uh, so this is a good way to experiment with automation, and you can also get out of here and use the REPL history to get uh, a recording of everything that you've typed. So you can just copy and paste these directly into uh, a, a Hackium script uh, and, and share these with other people. So the shareability was a, uh, a, a very, very high priority for Hackium because historically it's been pretty difficult for people to share their work uh, m manipulating websites. Like if, if I were to make something uh, neat that manipulated google.com or change the functionality of Spotify or Twitter or whatever else, uh, it would be fairly difficult for me to uh, just quickly share that with somebody else. Uh, there are two main ways that uh, people have historically manipulated websites. 
and that's either via, via the uh, embedded browser dev tools or uh, with a proxy or both. Uh, so a proxy would give you access to uh, to to uh, to intercept and manipulate and change any transactions for the web, uh, which is very very powerful. Uh, but if you if you've worked with proxies extensively in the past, you know that they can be somewhat of a pain to install, uh, especially if you're talking about uh, different platforms, Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, or whatever. Uh, and if you do go this route, then chances are you have a favorite proxy. Uh, and if you try to share it with somebody else, they've got a different favorite proxy or a different configuration for the same proxy or something that makes it difficult to just quickly share your work with somebody else. Now, if we do a lot of our work within the embedded browser developer tools, uh, which are extremely powerful uh, and fantastic, definitely, um, we have no way really whatsoever to share that with anybody else. Uh, a lot of the work is manual. Uh, it's difficult to automate if it's possible to automate at all. Uh, there are like content snippets uh, and other little things that you can use to, uh, to, uh, to, to repeat repetitive work, uh, but those aren't easily shareable. They're not easy to really configure in the first place for yourself. Uh, and all in all, it's just, it's kind of a pain when you do this work, you get all set up yourself uh, and it becomes difficult for anyone to, uh, to use your stuff. So with Hackium, uh, it was a priority for me to get everything as self-contained uh, and bundled into one project as possible uh, so that if you wanted to, you could share uh, just a, a small configuration implementation to anybody and they can see what you've done. One of the important aspects of shareability is making sure that uh, the user this is destined for doesn't have to know anything secret or magic about your configuration to get up and running. Uh, so we take care of that with Hackium by uh, making a lot of the base configuration uh, stored in a configuration file that is just JSON or JavaScript uh, and is portable so that you can deliver it to anyone else. You can initialize one uh, easily just by using Hackium init. Uh, you can set up the URL you want to go to by default. Uh, you can configure whether or not you want DevTools to open automatically, which might be important for your script if you're communicating with DevTools. Uh, we are not going to do that here. Uh, we can create a blank JavaScript injection. One of the other top priorities for Hackium was to make sure that it was as trivial as possible uh, to inject JavaScript before anything else is loaded, uh, which is the only way that you can guarantee a pristine, stable environment for your code, uh, and to also make it trivial to intercept and manipulate content coming in so that you didn't need a proxy at all. Uh, so Hackium makes that possible uh, with just generic injection files uh, and interceptor modules. So we're gonna say no to that. Uh, we will create a boilerplate interceptor uh, and sure, a boilerplate Hackium script. Uh, we do not want to run headless. So now we have our hackium.config.js. Uh, it's just a simple JavaScript file with uh, the configurations that we set up. We can see that we have a boilerplate interceptor. Uh, an interceptor is just a standard Node.js module uh, that exports two properties. One is uh, the intercept property, which is an array of uh, request patterns that this interceptor will be configured to intercept. So here by default, uh, you can see that we have just a, a wildcard asterisk for the URL pattern, uh, and we are matching uh, script resource types, and we are doing it at the response stage. Uh, and the second thing that an interceptor needs to export is the interceptor property which takes a synchronous or asynchronous function uh, that can just do something with uh, a request. So to share this work, uh, we could just archive this directory, uh, we could upload it to GitHub, uh, we could publish it to whatever publishy service you want, uh, and anyone can download that and uh, run Hackium with just the command Hackium and uh, see what you did. So now that we've gone over the REPL and the getting started, uh, we can jump into what makes Hackium different than uh, other browsers and how to use its APIs to connect to external services. So if you follow me at all, you know that I talk a lot about automated attacks, things like credential stuffing, scraping, and the trajectory of tools looking more and more human. 
Alice, since this is a browser uh, that is uh, controlled partially by uh, scripts or, or extensions or power tools that, that do stuff, uh, it's important for those uh, for the for the for the uh, behavior that is being generated uh, to look plausibly human, so that it doesn't interrupt your browsing and your usage. So one of the extensions onto Puppeteer uh, that Hacking provides is. Uh, automatically generated simulated human behavior. Now Puppeteer and a lot of other automation tools have the ability to uh, slow down behavior so that it doesn't come uh, all puking out on the page all at once. Uh, you don't type it large, large blocks of text uh, within a fraction of a second all at once. You can slow it down. Uh, but still, that's not quite human enough. Humans don't have uh, the consistent durations between key presses. Uh, or mouse movements that all take a certain number of steps. So one of the things I did with Hackium was to make sure that things like keyboard events uh, happen uh, at, at different uh, intervals and durations, all within a minimum and maximum expected human behavior. Uh, and things like mouse movements follow non-direct paths and sometimes make mistakes uh, like this. So this is a slow meandering move. Uh, you can see down over here, I uh, kind of have to curve up to get to the point we're looking at. Refresh again, a random, larger curve, uh, much slower this time. Uh, we also overshoot and have to backtrack. Uh, do this again, overshoot and backtrack. Now things that, uh, where if you're looking at it, it would not definitely be automated behavior. Uh, this is important because just naive automation detection techniques uh, will, will check to see whether or not you're clicking consistently at like a zero, zero position on every element. Or if you're zipping from one point to another with no mouse move events uh, in between. Um, or if you're moving all in a straight line or at the same velocity, uh, things like that. Uh, so we have to account for that so that we can, uh, we can generate behavior that is not automatically blocked by everything that's out there. Now, another thing that uh, you'll probably know if you follow me uh, is that I hate CAPTCHAs. Uh, CAPTCHAs are just such a pain in the ass. Most of them are really, really, really bad. And things like uh, reCAPTCHA, Google's reCAPTCHA, have uh, seem like they've gotten much, much worse over time. You know, like things like the, the little grid of pictures where you have to determine what a fire hydrant is or what a bus is, crosswalk, things like that. Uh, they're a pain. And uh, CAPTCHAs are things that will pop up in the way of automation all the time. Uh, and and, and it's, a, it's an arms race back and forth trying to make uh, an automated tool that bypasses CAPTCHAs and then CAPTCHA makers uh, get that tool, figure out how to block it, blah, blah, blah. Now, rather than build in any CAPTCHA solving within Hackium, uh, it's much easier to delegate that responsibility to services and companies whose uh, a core purpose is solving and bypassing CAPTCHAs. So you can wire up services like 2CAPTCHA very easily within Hackium scripts uh, just by uh, using standard node libraries and node modules to make requests uh, and parse JSON responses. So this is uh, a script that I put together. Uh, I am sucking in my API key here just so you don't see it. And uh, next we're going to go to uh, HTTPS old.reddit.com slash login. Uh, we are going to initiate a capture request with our API key. Uh, we get a request ID. And then we type in uh, our username into the user reg input, Samuel Clemens 90210. We type in our password twice uh, on the password inputs. CTEC Astronomy is our password. Uh, and then we poll for request results. So the way these CAPTCHA solvers work uh, is that you send a request, it's like, hey, solve this CAPTCHA, uh, and then you poll for a response uh, for when that CAPTCHA is done. So you're just not sitting there waiting, you can do additional work uh, while that CAPTCHA is, uh, is being solved. So after we've solved that, uh, we input the CAPTCHA response to an element on the page, g-recaptcha-response, uh, and then we submit. So now we can run this script, uh, hackium-e-index.js. It'll pop open Hackium. Go to reddit.com's signup page. Notice how the, the keyboard uh, typing is not instantaneous, uh, but it's not consistently slow. It's kind of a blah, 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 blah. That's, that's the, the technical term for that. 
So now that we're done, we're gonna pop over to the console, uh, see that we're waiting um, an initial timeout uh, for uh, uh, two captcha. And then we are done waiting, so now we're polling for our uh, response. And now that we're done, pop over to the web page and bam, Samuel Clemens 90210, we are on Reddit. We are able to, I don't know, prop up whatever political candidate we are interested in this election cycle. Uh, and this is just one technique for getting Pi, uh, all the different uh, defenses out there. Uh, and uh, now I wanna make this clear, uh, I do currently work at Shape and F5. Hackium is not a tool designed to bypass security defenses. Uh, security defenses for things like uh, credential stuffing or spamming or scraping, uh, those operate at, uh, at, at high volumes. Uh, and the type of work that uh, they, a legitimate and curious hacker using Hackium would do is much, much smaller volume uh, so that you can bypass things at small volume, uh, but you'd be caught at high volume cover my ass. All right, so, so far, I've talked uh, a bit about just basic usage of Hackium with the, the REPL and other stuff. Uh, I talked about the uh, extensions it has in order to make it look more human driven, uh, as well as showed an example of how to tie it to other services. Uh, and I haven't even touched at all on uh, the other parts of the suite of tools, shift refactor and shift interpreter, uh, nor have I talked really much about uh, the whole point I made at the start, which is uh, about manipulating website content, uh, which leads me into uh, Hackium interceptors. So interceptors, like we've already gone over, uh, are just basic node modules uh, that intercept a particular uh, URL or request pattern and just do something with it. You can use the hacking uh, command to uh, initialize some basic interceptors. Uh, we'll call ours interceptor.js. Uh, we can use a basic interceptor tab, in, uh, a basic interceptor template, which uh, just doesn't really do all that much. Just gives you the boilerplate. Uh, a pretty printer, which uses uh, prettier to format JavaScript. So we're going to start a uh, basic transformer using shift refactor. The shift refactor is a library I created uh, that makes it easy to query and transform nodes of a JavaScript AST. An AST, an abstract syntax tree, uh, is just a, a data structure that represents uh, something that was parsed. Uh, so the AST I'm talking about is just a big old JavaScript object uh, that represents JavaScript source code. You can use a tool like AST Explorer uh, to just paste JavaScript in and see what AST it generates. So you can pop through each of the nodes uh, and uh, see what types they are, see how they're structured. And if you change any of those uh, and regenerate source from that AST, then you change the JavaScript source. So shift refactor takes JavaScript source, parses it into an AST, uh, and then analyzes the scope tree, uh, creates parent mapping, uh, basically does a lot of legwork that makes it easy to do queries and translation on it. It also leverages shift query, uh, which allows you to query a JavaScript AST with CSS-like selectors. And I modeled shift refactor based off of the uh, jQuery API. So it actually feels very, very similar to navigate and traverse and replace large trees. Uh, so we have a script object based around our uh, parsed uh, response body. Uh, this, part, this expression replaces all console log expressions with alert calls. Uh, so we make a query for call expressions uh, that have an object name of console and a property of log. And we, re we replace those with call expressions uh, for uh, alert. And we translate the arguments uh, from the console to the arguments for the alert. Now, as I'm breezing through this, uh, I know that I am glossing over some fairly complex topics if you haven't played with JavaScript ASTs before. Uh, but I can't stress this enough. Uh, despite all the crazy terms and syntax like call expression and call E, and identifier expressions and some more that you'll see. Uh, those are just nodes of a JavaScript tree. And all you're dealing with is a gigantic JavaScript tree 
uh, in a similar way that you would navigate or traverse the DOM. So it, it might look foreign at the start, but don't let that dissuade you from jumping into this because it's it's not difficult to get a hold on it once you, you get the practice in. So here we've got a basic web page that exists only to simulate a real world scenario uh, because I'm going to be jumping into uh, programmatically de-obfuscating JavaScript. And there are plenty of real world examples out there. Uh, and you probably have seen a few of those if you've been looking through uh, a web page source. Um, but uh, we run into some uh, sketchy legal ground if I'm de-obfuscating uh, that live in front of people. So we've got a nice little sample website here uh, that I've crafted to look like a payment form um, that has a uh, conveniently, a, uh, an obfuscated bit of JavaScript uh, just floating around on it. This is a sample of obfuscated JavaScript uh, that was obfuscated via obfuscator.io, which is a pretty common uh, JavaScript obfuscation website because it's the first URL that pops up when you search for JavaScript obfuscator. Uh, it actually does a pretty good job at obfuscating JavaScript. It can inject dead code, it can shuffle uh, things, uh, but it is extremely difficult to protect JavaScript. And obfuscation really doesn't actually put all that much of a barrier in front of an adversary trying to understand the JavaScript. Um, so we're gonna go through and show how this can be completely reversed uh, and sent to the browser before the browser even gets it. So it looks as though you are browsing the web uh, with deobfuscated JavaScript. So this is using Firefox's DevTools. Uh, even if we pretty print this, uh, it's not all that much more readable. Uh, you see here that we start off with a uh, list of encoded strings, clearly encoded strings. Uh, we are followed by a variable declaration uh, that, I don't know, does stuff. It has uh, a, an alphabet here, uh, and given that these are encoded, uh, this is probably the decoder. I uh, would go down here, uh, and we see references to that function uh, all over the place. So 0x227, uh, 0x227a, uh, 27a, 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 27a. Uh, this is this is a uh, common method of uh, making it more difficult for somebody to uh, immediately understand what is going on with JavaScript. So I've created a complete interceptor here uh, so that I don't have to code in front of all of you because uh, I mean, that's, that's not very exciting, is it? So we set our URL pattern to uh, the vendor file that I had on my local server. And we uh, have uh, fleshed out the interceptor so that we are running it through refactor uh, and also loading up our interpreter via shift interpreter uh, and uh, massaging some JavaScript. Uh, so refactor, we already went over a little bit. Uh, we are sending it the response body and we're also uh, adding a common methods plugin. Next, we are creating our interpreter uh, instance, and we're loading the uh, the scripts AST, and we are passing it a context that we are requiring in from here. So the context is like the set of global variables uh, that are accessible uh, by JavaScript, and by default, this interpreter uh, doesn't have anything in its global context. So if we want to expose things that the interpreter needs, uh, then we're going to have to explicitly set them. And we can do it ourselves, it's just a plain old JavaScript object. Uh, I've put together a, a fairly basic and simple uh, DOM lookalike context that uses JS DOM in order to simulate a, a, a browser DOM. So if you're interpreting browser side JavaScript, it'll have access to things like uh, image elements, um, uh, A to B, B to A, URL, URI, decodes, something, uh, whatever, all those things. Uh, one of the interesting things about this interpreter is that it was designed so that it can take uh, statements or expressions uh, piecemeal. So you don't have to execute a script uh, statement by statement, expression by expression in the uh, flow that a script would expect to be executed in. Uh, you can take any statement or expression 
out of the AST and pass it to the interpreter and uh, interpret it as if that was the next expression or statement. Uh, this is very, very handy when you're dealing with JavaScript like the way I'm dealing with it because uh, sometimes we don't want to execute all the JavaScript. Uh, and we want to just execute only the pieces that we want to reuse uh, so that we don't have to uh, write our own decoder functions uh, or copy and paste anything. Uh, we can just grab it, uh, interpret bits and pieces of it, and then use that to deobfuscate the rest of the script. So it's like using JavaScript against itself. So here we're going to uh, run the first statement in the script, which is this. So this uh, basically primes this variable with these values so that anything else that we execute can access that variable. Next, we're going to be getting uh, the decoder, which is the second statement there. Uh, rather than run it directly, we're going to assign it to a variable so we can play with it later. Uh, and we're going to run that decoder statement, which is a variable declaration statement that assigns a function expression to a variable. Next up, uh, we're going to uh, query uh, the innards of that decoder statement uh, in order to get the first binding identifier. Now, a binding identifier is an identifier, like a variable name or something like that, that is basically being assigned to or, or having a value bound to it. Uh, and what that means here is basically we want to get that because we want to know how this function is referenced. So we're looking for this binding identifier. See, it's, it's not that complicated once you start poking through and, and, uh, and, and playing around with things. It sounds weird and, and scary to, to some people, but it's not that bad. Uh, next up, we want to get all the references to that name. So that binding identifier is called throughout the script. We want to get all the references, the places where it's called, so that we can do stuff with it. And we're going to map those references and grab the, uh, the node of that reference. So a reference is an object uh, that has a node property in it, which is an AST node, uh, an accessibility property, uh, which tells you whether or not the reference is being read to, written to, or uh, is read write. So then with those references, uh, they're all going to be like an identifier expressions. So like, let's see down here. So an identifier expression is just this bit of code right here. So we want to get this bit of code, which is the, the reference uh, where it's being used as an identifier expression uh, as the child of a call expression. So here we're getting uh, all of the parents of our references and we're filtering out all of those looking for call expressions. That just makes sure that we don't uh, we don't catch any references that aren't call expressions. I think almost all of them, if not all of them, are in this script, so it's not a big deal. But it's it's good to be safe. And we're going to replace all of those with the stringified result of the interpreter value executing those functions. So we need to JSON .stringify. So it's a string that contains a string which is the return value of these functions. You still with me? Basically, what we're getting are the decoded values of these strings. So we've done a lot without actually seeing the effect yet. Uh, let's uh, comment out these statements so we can see our transformations take effect uh, before, uh, before we do too much magic. And then after that, we are printing out the refactored script to the response.body and returning the response. And bam, we are uh, just about done. All right, we go automatically to our payment page. Uh, let's check our resources. Here's our script. Uh, still looks mostly the same, uh, mostly because we didn't change those top two statements. Uh, but everything afterward, you'll notice that it no longer has uh, those function calls anymore. Now you see those computed member access uh, uh, blocks right there? Uh, those are uh, those still JavaScript still works, um, but they're not as easily parsable by at least my brain. And uh, now that we've translated all the function calls to strings, we no longer need them to be computed anymore. We can translate them back to static properties. Uh, so instead of blob square string, we can do blah dot string. Um, well, not string, but like the actual thing. You, you know what I'm talking about. 
Um, and this is where those functions that we, we deleted come into play. Script.convert computer to static is part of the common methods plugin. And the next two statements there, just delete uh, the two statements above our main script because we don't need them anymore. The strings have been decoded. And since all the strings have been decoded, we no longer need the decoder function. So let's get rid of those and clean up our uh, unobfuscated script. Deobfuscated script? Un unop un undeobfuscated? I don't know. So now let's load up Hackium again. Uh, check our script and uh, oof, nothing's there. Oh, it is there. Uh, we actually, we had scrolled down, uh, we were too low. But now this is our script. This is, this is basically very close to the original script, uh, minus some still, uh, the identifiers that are still wonky, but not much we can do about that. Um, but you can see what it's doing. There, there's no sort of misdirection uh, anymore and uh, it's real code. All right, that's, that's it. There's just a few lines of JavaScript uh, that can just completely deobfuscate uh, obfuscated JavaScript. Now I, I'm talking a lot about deobfuscation, uh, but there is a lot you can do uh, with all the JavaScript across the web. Uh, even a site like twitter.com uh, has a, a huge array of user-friendly intuitive methods that could just uh, provide you with an API to all of Twitter. Uh, but it's hidden away in the JavaScript so that you can't touch it via the console or anything else. Now, all you have to do is find out where those beautiful little functions are uh, and just expose them to the global namespace so that you can access them via the console or via Hackium scripts or, or whatever. And by, uh, if you're not a JavaScript expert, by exposing, uh, exposing to the global namespace, all I'm saying is uh, take a chunk of JavaScript and prepend to it uh, like a, a, a window dot my exposed variable equals the stuff you want to expose. And that's it. Like you, you, you have an exposed API that you can access easily with Hackium scripts, uh, which then allows you uh, to basically tweet via Node.js uh, without using a developer API key or anything like that. Well, that's about all I can cover in the session. And we actually smashed a whole lot of, of content in a very, very short period of time. Uh, but it's because I was so excited and there's still so much more to talk about. Uh, there, this is just the tip of the iceberg and I just barely dove into what shift refactor and shift interpreter can do. And I didn't even talk about any plugins. Uh, and, and I didn't talk about the Chrome extension API talking with the Chrome dev tools protocol and, uh, all sorts of stuff that I could just talk about for, for days or hours or, or, uh, so much time. Uh, I'm going to be putting uh, more of this content on uh, YouTube because that's, I guess, how people consume content nowadays. Uh, and I'll probably write some stuff up. But if you if you like anything I've talked about, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at, at JS Overson. There's probably a link somewhere nearby. Actually, I think I'm I should be talking to somebody in Discord. Uh, you talk to me. Um, but yeah, I like this stuff. I, I like I like I like making the web do things that I want it to do. Um, and this is why I built this stuff and uh, I hope you enjoy it. And uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, AppSec Village. Uh, thank you, DEF CON. Thank you, uh, all of you for watching this. Uh, this has been awesome. Thank you very much. Bye.